Hello. So in this video, I'm joined by Michael Barabe and Jennifer Ruth, and we're going to talk about their book, It's Not Free Speech, uh, Race, Democracy, and the Future of Academic Freedom. But first off, thank you so much, both of you, for joining me. Thanks for inviting us. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll start by introducing Michael, since his name is first on the book. Um, Michael Barabe is an Edwin Earl Sparks Professor of Literature at Pennsylvania State University. He's the author of 12 books to date, including Public Access, Literary Theory, and American Cultural Politics from Verso in 1994, Life as We Know It, A Father, a Family, and an Exceptional Child from Pantheon in 1996, and then the paperback version from Vintage in 1998, and What's Liberal About the Liberal Arts, Classroom Politics and Bias in Higher Education from Norton in 2006. He's also published two edited collections, Higher Education Under Fire, Politics, Economics, and the Crisis of the Humanities from Routledge in 1995 with Kerry Nelson, and The Aesthetics of Cultural Studies from Blackwell in 2005. Life as We Know It was a New York Times Notable Book of the Year for 1996 and was chosen as one of the best books of the year on a list of seven by Maureen Corrigan of National Public Radio. Jennifer Ruth is an Associate Dean in the College of the Arts and a professor in the School of Film at Portland State University. She's a contributing editor for Academe Blog and the author with Michael Barabe of It's Not Free Speech, Race, Democracy, and the Future of Academic Freedom. She's written about academic freedom and higher education in such uh, publications as The New Republic, The Chronicle of Higher Education, and Miss, and is a co-editor with Ellen Schreckner, uh, Schrecker, sorry, and Valerie Johnson of The Right to Learn, Resisting the Right-Wing Attack on Academic Freedom, to be published by the Beacon Press in the spring of 2024. So, um, jumping right into this, um, one of the key issues in this book is the extent to which freedom of speech and academic freedom align or overlap. Um, so, could could you start by defining each of these terms, freedom of speech and academic freedom, and sort of telling us why you, you've settled on the definitions that you have? I'll take it. Um, also because I just did a local Penn State TEDx talk responding precisely to that question. So the free speech is relatively uh, straightforward. It's got quite a case law to it. it pretty much anything goes short of defamation and slander, uh, fraud, child pornography, and threats of imminent violence. And the violence has to be truly imminent, uh, unfortunately. Uh, it can't just be a controversial speaker coming to campus. It has to be neo-Nazis running at you with pitchforks and TP torches right now. At least that's the case law. Uh, the violence has to be uh, really <clears throat> uh, right at your doorstep. Academic freedom has never really been verified by the courts. A 1967 decision striking down loyalty oaths uh, did say that academic freedom is a special concern of the First Amendment, but didn't really say how, and didn't make clear whether it was uh, a property that was enjoyed by universities as a whole, to be autonomous from church, state, donors, trustees, or whether it was an individual right of individual professors, or a collective right of professors as well. Uh, there are various ways to take this. But so that's why we start with the uh, what is really the gold standard, the 1940 Statement of Principles of the American Association of University Professors. Um, it, come, it has uh, three parts to it. Uh, there's a sort of bullet point distillation, whereas the originating 1915 Declaration of Principles was a kind of nine-page chatty manifesto, which is why we go with the 1940 Statement. It was... Uh, much more clarifying and much easier to incorporate into faculty handbooks. Uh, freedom in, uh, in research and in the publication of the results. That's one. Almost never controversial. Except when, I think of two, two cases, uh, a corporation sponsors research uh, and then doesn't like what, what, what they find and tries to suppress the results. The other has to do with our former colleague here at Penn State, Michael Mann, who worked on climate change to uh, harass for, for a decade. So it can happen. Uh, the uh, uh, academic freedom research is challenged, but it's relatively rare. Second one is academic freedom teaching. Uh, that 
is something we we take up in the book because it's where many more of the controversies uh, can be found. The question of uh, basically <clears throat> allows teachers the freedom of teaching their subject, but does not allow them to introduce irrelevant material, controversial material that has no relation to their subject. And then in 1970, after the 60s happened, the AUP went back um, after turmoil in, in classrooms and off on campuses and tried to make it clear that the intent of the statement is not to discourage what is controversial. Controversy is at the heart of the academic enterprise. The entire statement seeks to foster, at this point, practically word for word. But the real uh, problem is introducing ir the persistent intrusion of irrelevance. Okay, that's where studies cross a lot. And I would put a lot of weight on the word persistent, which, by the way, does not appear in Penn State's uh, academic freedom guidelines. I tried to put it there, and I got met with pushback from our then provost, Mike Jones, who said, well, why don't go ahead and try to define persistent? And I said, well, let's go by the rule of Freud and folktales. Three is a pattern. And he said, you really want to put three in there? I said, no, I do not put three in there. But I mean, come on, the point is, if you don't, Start prosecuting people for a one-off remark about Trump or Biden or a tsunami or a, a massacre in the Middle East. Okay. The really curious thing, though, is thing three. And this is where the relationship between academic freedom and freedom of speech gets complicated. Because the American tradition, unlike any other, incorporates free speech as an element of academic freedom. So even though there's a very clear distinction between them, because academic freedom depends on scholarly expertise, Free speech does not. Free speech, you pretty much go off all, all you want about the secret reign of the lizard people, or the fact that the moon landings were faked, or that you should get your medical advice from Joe Rogan. But academic freedom requires some element of expertise, except that it also includes extramural speech, which is basically free speech, on the grounds that no professor should give up their first amendment rights to take a job at a university. But, at the last bit, this produces a paradox where professors who speak in social media or at the public square have less freedom, have they have less latitude when they speak as experts than when they speak outside their discipline. So <clears throat> Jennifer is tired of hearing me use this analogy, but it became extremely relevant because of Taylor Swift. The last five Super Bowls were rigged. This one on behalf of Taylor Swift. And if I say that, you pretty much know I'm, I'm a crack. And I can be this, you know, Ignore. But if I were to go off as a professor of disability studies and say that there are circumstances under which if people with intellectual disabilities should be exterminated and they were tried to have done so in the first half of the 20th century, I am pretty much prima facie declaring myself to be unfit as a professor of disability studies or a professor of anything else. And the idea is that a, a, a Holocaust denier who's an electrical engineer is just a crank, a Holocaust denier who's a historian is unfit to be a, to be a historian. So that's, I mean, parsing that out is uh, tricky because you don't know exactly what, uh, sometimes when people are speaking in their area of expertise or test it. Oh, excuse me. There's also the fact that the original uh, elaboration of this principle by the AUP spoke of, you know, speaking with restraint and with respect for others. And of course, they didn't envisage Twitter where that's not even allowed. So um, there's no requirement any longer that when professors speak as citizens that they show restraint or uh, respect for the opinions of others, but they are required to make it clear that they're not speaking for their institution. Still, most of the controversies for the last couple of decades, certainly most of the controversies we discuss in our book, have to do with extramural speech and determining when extramural speech might be disqualified. The AUP, uh, the AUP standard on this is rare. Extramural speech is rarely relevant to the determination of fitness, but not never. Yeah, and if I could just add, Philip, you asked why we wanted to emphasize the particular definitions that we did, because while they are the correct definitions and not as well widely understood as they should be among faculty, much less the public at large, um, why bring them up and why emphasize them to the point of even our title? It's academic freedom is not free speech at this moment in time. So Michael mentioned that a lot of that, you know, the incredible decontextualizing apparatus and sort of politicizing apparatus of social media creates a, that it creates a situation where extramural speech is often in the headlines around faculty disciplining or doing something outrageous or some kind of scandal. 
And one of the things that we were noticing at the, around when we, you know, we started working on this in 2020. Um, so it, it predates the, the sort of spread of legislative bills trying to ban divisive context and, uh, concepts and that kind of thing. But when we started working on this, we were noticing, for example, that a contingent faculty who says something on social media that sparks outrage, gets a, gets a, you know, 500 lines in campus reform, gets alumni calling, um, calling administrators. That person can just simply not be rehired because they caused a headache. Uh, tenured faculty have due process. That's one side. On the other side, we were watching in horror with a lot of America as we had the rise of a president who was not interested in the norms that preexisted, not interested in institutional, you know, rules, rule of law, and. Um, was emboldening a level of speech and also a return to ideas that we had imagined were had long since been dispatched to the dustbin of history, right? So there's this attempt to revitalize, renew ideas that really had no credibility. So thus, and so it's no accident that one of the first sort of cancel cultures, these students are out of control kinds of uh, scandals was around Charles Murray, right? And he's the one with the, um, mm -hmm. the IT stuff. So, so we were looking at this and we were thinking, we're not legal scholars. We're not First Amendment scholars. This is also, by the way, it's worth noting at the same time that Facebook executives are going in front of the Congress and talking about the sort of deterioration of teenage mental health. And, and there's questions about regulating social media and regulating speech. We figure we can't touch that. That's not our expertise. Academic freedom, however, both of us have a long history and working on writing about even adjudicating even working on our campuses and faculty senate and other forms on academic freedom and so while free speech is almost, as michael made very clear almost impossible to hold someone accountable in fact for a democracy to be considered legitimate we have to be able to talk back to our to the state the first amendment protects speech political speech speech that could be critical of the state dissent right so even if what we're saying has very little basis in evidence, we have to be able to criticize the state. Academic freedom, on the other hand, doesn't have those same kinds of that same kind of uh, legitimating wide latitude parameters. Rather, with academic freedom and in a university context, research, teaching, student writing, making judgments, discerning between good statements and bad statements, credible statements and incredible statements. That's our whole stock and trade. That's what we do. And the idea is that for a democracy to have access to competent information, and that includes interpretation, not just facts, then we need to have a university that's independent from politics or the market. It's never been completely independent, of course, but to some degree have some autonomy so that the public can trust that the information hasn't been manipulated and coerced for ends, um, non-democratic or you know, market or state ends. So we were watching this, we were watching what's happening and we were feeling like we are seeing a rise among opportunist academics um, who, are, who are legitimating ideas that 99.9% .9 of their peers in their disciplines uh, would not endorse would not consider legitimate so and this is only going to get worse potentially as the the sort of uh, anti-democratic forces and the rise of authoritarianism continues so while we can't do much about free speech god bless the people who try to um let's at least put our own house in order around academic freedom and protect contingent faculty who scandals are likely to unfairly, disproportionately um, render unemployed and hold accountable tenured faculty who, and these are gonna be in the, mi the extreme minority, right? There's, these are not, this is not, a, this is not open um, the floodgates to you know, assessing the whole body of work of everyone and then determining whether they're, they're fit or not. These are, you know, make it possible to hold professors accountable when they're speaking, claiming their expertise, claiming the legitimacy of their degrees, et cetera, their books, their imprimatur of their university, 
and yet espousing things that can't be uh can't be held up can't be can't withstand scrutiny and yet it can get circulated in this new environment that we live in and become a political weapon for for, for anti-democratic forces so that's what that's why the, these particular definitions of free speech versus academic freedom became so important and why it felt important that people understand academic freedom is not free speech. There may be free speech absolutism, but academic freedom absolutism would render the university incoherent. Oh, we, yeah, we should we should say that we should. We, yeah. <laughs> we keep finding new formulations for what we already. <laughs> right, exactly. So uh, first, I'll say, as a contingent faculty member myself, I really do appreciate the focus in the book on the particular vulnerability of contingent faculty members. Um, but I think I think one of the things that you've been talking about that's really, really important to to just sort of emphasize is that academic freedom is kind of, is not ultimately right about assessing the truth of a statement. It's about assessing whether or not the statement is defendable given the norms of uh, academic inquiry, the scientific method, uh, historiographic techniques, um, accepted literary interpretations, whatever it is. Um, right. So, because I mean, there's a lot, of, we've been, we've been in a post-truth era for an uncomfortably long period of time now. And so it's not necessarily there. What you're advocating is not the university should get to determine what is and isn't true. And anyone who says something that's not true, according to the university faces disciplinary action. It's if you say something that clearly cannot be supported by the norms of your discipline, that's where academic integrity or academic freedom issues may may come into play. Is that a fair? Academic, absolutely. And academic integrity right. is a good phrase. And then when you want to say academic freedom, I think the protections of academic freedom should not be invoked on, in those yeah. or cannot be. Yeah. Okay. No, I think that's right. Um, I'll add to that that we've gotten pushback, and I, I got it personally from Keith Whittington of Princeton that uh this argument is ultimately a conserv our argument is ultimately a conservative argument precisely because it inevitably defers to disciplinary norms and i got two responses to that first of all as jennifer mentioned we're not first amendment scholars we're from the humanities we believe 18 impossible things before breakfast <laughs> I mean, we're the people who brought you the crackpot avant-garde the last quarter millennia so we have a pretty high tolerance for things that are not necessarily true but should be entertained and as long as they are defensible uh, with some intellectual foundation. The second thing, well, is that disciplinary norms themselves are not static things. You look at the last 40 years, humanity has derived queer theory, new historicism, post-structuralism, deconstruction, um, and it's actually the historian, Joan Wallach Scott, who ironically criticized our book, but we actually draw on her argument that this, she's the person who wrote gender, a useful category of historical analysis at a time when a lot of historians did not think of gender as a useful category of historical analysis. I teach uh, classes in disability studies. I have no degree in disability studies because in 1989 I got my PhD. There wasn't disability studies in the humanities. So we have a pretty fluid sense of disciplinary norms. We don't think of them as, you know, written in stone. What, and we have a very high bar for <laughs> uh, trying to entertain the possibility that someone might be unfit. Um, when Jennifer alludes to beliefs that 99.9% .9 of one's peers don't share, one example uh, fairly unfortunately prominent at her own university is the pro-colonialist professor, Bruce Gilly. Um, and it, was, it turned up, again, it's not a, a question of numbers. Uh, Jonathan Marks uh, at Yersinus College uh, criticized us for you know, basically saying, Come on, how many white supremacists are we talking about here? The prof professoriate already leans left. The conservatives who are, are around are, tend not to be far right fringe people. And he and I engaged in a, an exchange in the Heterodox Academy blog, and I said, it's not a question of numbers. It's a question of whether this stuff 
has any intellectual foundation at all. Spoiler alert, it does not. And I also would say the same of people who are, you know, conspiracy theorists. Um, two of whom we mentioned in the book were fired, Joey Carriga at Oberlin and James Tracy of Florida Atlantic, and another, Mark Crispin Miller at NYU, um, who's still under fire, but still has a job. Uh, even though he's so basically he's, he's subscribed to worldwide conspiracy newsletter since 9-11 and has signed on for everything since, including Sandy Hook, including COVID trutherism. Um, and again, stuff with no intellectual basis whatsoever and frankly, at least an embarrassment for a professor of media and communication studies and possibly disqualified. Though, last thing, Jennifer and I do not make those calls ourselves. We say jury of their peers. Uh, we did not want to write a book there where it was like a table of like these things to exceed disciplinary norms or violate them, and these are forbidden. We're, we're not about that. We have a fluid sense of disciplinary norms, and we have a great respect for peer review. So I do want us to, to come back to that uh, in a little bit. Can um, I ask real quick? Oh, yeah. Okay, great. A um, couple of things. One is that. Uh, when we were when we were working on the book and we looked at someone like amy wax or bruce gilly a lot of times i mean we did our due diligence in terms of making sure that for example i wrote many scholars of regimes of colonialism of historians who worked on the kinds of issues that bruce gilly writes about and, and asked what their their sense of this person was and and they said ridiculous absurd but don't give him oxygen and that was something we heard a lot in 2020. To give them oxygen is to help mainstream or to help cre giving them oxygen, give them more attention. Giving them more attention increases, it seems to backfire instead of, instead of sort of outing them and holding them accountable or uh, debunking what they say. Instead, it seems to help it, it spread like wildfire. Well, giving them attention, not giving them attention, they're still spreading. It's still mainstreaming. National Association of Scholars, which Bruce Gilley is on the board for and writes for, they're now being cited and used in legislative bills. They were fairly fringe. When, certainly, they were nothing compared to American Association of University Professors um, in terms of how big the organization was and its sense of legitimacy in the profession. NAS was pretty fringe. Now it's getting quoted in the Chronicle of Higher Ed. And it, so the mainstreaming of these illegitimate ideas that don't have the don't seem credible to 99.9 percent .9 of Bruce Gilley's peers has happened whether you give it oxygen or not that's the the world that we live in and so it would have been nice to try and begin to have more academic freedom committees and so to come back to Michael emphasizing that we're not making that call if Bruce Gilley at my institution if an academic freedom committee if a dean or a provost were to refer the case to a panel of faculty senate, as did the dean at University of Pennsylvania for Amy Wax, and ask that panel to evaluate the person's work, statements, et cetera, and see if there's any kind of discipline or issue um, that should be raised, then that panel would presumably be made up of people in his discipline or adjacent disciplines, or people outside the university in his discipline, adjacent disciplines. I wouldn't be on that panel, right? So part of the thing, too, is that uh, one of the criticisms we got was first, in, in, in even writing it, don't give these people oxygen. That didn't really seem to matter. Secondly, um, you know, how, who are you to define? We are not to define. We are not saying who's fit and who's unfit. We are saying that let contingent faculty have due process, because without tenure, there's no due process. So, and let tenured faculty who are arguably opportunists or right, white supremacists or the, let them have, let there be some degree of accountability for those people. And we, the, our solution for that in both cases is, is very, very lockstep with AUP principles of peer review, academic freedom committees through faculty senates that would provide a level of due process for people without it all together, or for those people who have moved through the ranks to a point where um, it's extraordinarily hard for post-tenure review or something to hold them accountable. 
So um, you've talked, you've started talking about the uh, the academic freedom committees that you all recommend in the book. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about like how you envision those uh, those functioning? We've gotten kind of a sense of it, but what what would you imagine they should look like, and how would they work? Jennifer, that was your chapter. You should kick off. Sorry, I thought you were gesturing that you wanted to take it, and then you were struggling with your unmute. <laughs> That's what I thought was happening. Um, okay, so there's it, it's complex, right? Um, and so, for example, there are actually academic freedom committees at a at fifty percent of universities, and they typically are grievance um, committees. If something goes wrong with the tenure process or things like that. And so they exist to some extent, but they don't exist framed the way that we would like to see them framed. Um, I think it really is. Here's another place in which, to some degree, who, part of the problem with, you know, any faculty who argues that tenured faculty need to be held accountable at all is likely to get an enormous amount of pushback because we all see, we all see our own foibles. We all know that we made we made an argument that can't doesn't really stand up, or we made a, a, a sort of indiscreet remark here or there. So we imagine we imagine that we might be you know held up to this kind of standard or scrutiny. Um, so we're really we have trouble with the the idea. But an academic freedom, but it, so but it has to be. So one of the things to remember is that while we don't necessarily trust each other, faculty peers. We trust each other more than we trust administrators or uninformed juries or judges or um, politicians. So the idea is that we, to some extent, we're taking the sort of peer review and the decentralized to an extreme degree in the sense that it really is up to faculty senates everywhere to decide exactly what the parameters or what the sort of procedures. The idea would be that you could have a, a complaint, complaint about someone whose work isn't defensible someone whose work um someone who an adjunct who felt that they were not rehired for academic freedom issues you have a complaint and then depending on the substance of the the case you would figure out who who would be the appropriate people to evaluate who are the appropriate peers to evaluate it so how you set that up so you might have a standing committee that whose job is precisely to field these complaints or these cases and then figure out how they can best be adjudicated, who, who's most sort of qualified, what group of people is most qualified to write this sort of report, make a recommendation. So it could look different in different places. Put this another way. Uh, it is, like democracy itself, the very worst system except for all the others. And so we got some unexpected aloha from the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And otherwise, I mean, we uh, fire. Uh, we're at, that's, at this point, really the most prominent uh, defenders of uh, faculty and students and free expression on campus, but, uh, and so we'll, we will agree with FIRE in a lot of individual cases, we tend to, uh, but where we part ways and can't possibly do it more strenuously is that we really believe they conflate academic freedom and free speech much too, uh, what's, what is the adverb I want? Casually? I don't think it's casual, it's, I think it's deliberate, and it's also the fact that it, it's uh, part of the phenomenon of um, uh, not having contact with, you know, on the ground classroom experience, and the, the, it, it's, it's, it tends to be, a, it, it tends to be a place of some abstraction. So we did a first podcast interview with Nico Perino of Fire, and he said, you know, the funny thing is that, uh, even though we take exception to a lot of the things in this book, we thought the academic freedom committees are better than any alternative anyone can propose. We also got a very sympathetic review. I just forwarded it to Jennifer a few weeks ago. It, uh, I, it was not on the radar, but it was a, a review that largely agreed with our premises, but took issue with our remarks about administrators. So it was written by a mid-sized university president. And uh, surprise, I uh, thought we gave them short sh administrators short shrift for their uh, skills as managers. But yes, uh, universities have to be administered. And there's a lot to administration that faculty don't understand. 
But these matters, these matters should not be in the hands of one administrator, mid-level administrators, let alone EEI officials, Title IX officials, resources offices. And uh, yeah, I, I, I think even though there are inevitable uh, potential problems with the academic freedom, my, my worst fear is that they uh, become, uh, they, 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 it, it, it's unlikely that it could become the basis for like carrying out feuds, but these things do happen in academia. But as a general principle, we think turning over decision making by turning over decision making power in matters like this to a group beats turning it over to one individual, and certainly not an administrator, not a not a trustee, not a donor, not Bill Ackman, you know, right? So that's why um, we uh, came up with the idea. We did. It was very, mostly Jennifer's idea. One PS to it, though. Um, we didn't say, because we didn't want to get into the weeds about the composition of these committees or what have you, we didn't say anything about small institutions uh, who might actually have some problems staffing these committees in, in relevant. And so, in that case, you know, uh, when I was uh, put that question by a, a professor at Gallister College, I said, regional consortium? I mean, it's the same thing we do for external peer review for, for promotion and tenure. The other analogy, uh, which I think holds pretty well, is that we already have committees to investigate research fraud. And we do this, and again, these are, they could be appointed by administrators and they could uh, report to administrators, but they are done by the people who know what research fraud is. They are done by peers. Uh, we already have that at Penn State. And very interestingly, this is PS to the PS, our research fraud policy, and I think that of every reputable university, I started looking into this, carries with it uh, a, a sort of boomerang provision. And if you bring a charge of research fraud in bad faith, that charge redounds upon you. Uh, I think that principle should hold in cases of uh, controversies over academic freedom as well. So the last uh, question that I really wanted to, to ask you all um, in my review of this book, which is not yet in print as far as I know, um, I said that this could be further subtitled Professors Behaving Badly. Uh, there are so many stories in here, uh, and it is it is really actually kind of a joy to read because the storytelling is so good. Um, but there's so many stories of academics doing and saying reprehensible things, stupid things, awkward things, uncomfortable things. Um, do you think that there's a certain sort of humility check value uh, for academics to read this book and, and sort of be reminded that even in our ivory towers, we're, we're sort of subject to the same types of, of foibles and prejudices and misinformation as, as non-academics i actually would frame it differently and it, and it has to do with the sort of increasing esteem in which i hold michael's chapter on context the first chapter i actually think that it it's i agree with you though i mean when, when i'm reading michael's writing it's a joy of storytelling and it's 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 laugh out loud at times about some of the foibles of faculty or the smugness of faculty but actually what it should do, what the book should do, is reassure those people who instantly recoil at the idea that faculty should be holding one another accountable for misinformation, for bad arguments, for opportunism. Um, it, it should reassure them because, for example, we, we, we spend a lot of time looking at the context of one tweet that might really have upset somebody. Um, and and show the kind of level of care and attention that would have to go into interpreting and evaluating these cases. So to reassure people that we're not, you know, that this is not, a, this is precisely, the, we're, we don't know about free speech, but in the realm of academic freedom, this is not rash judgment, right? So especially like the, the case where the veteran who made a, who was satirical about the death of a private and who, who said, oh, you know, made a satirical joke about, oh, you don't realize that in the old boys club, you better just shut up and um, and that people got were deeply offended. But if you saw, if you don't elevate 
impact over intention, but instead replace both of those with a deeper look into context, meaning, which does get you somewhat into intention because you should be able to respond and you should be able to, you know, respond to your accusers. Um, that actually, it shouldn't, you know, there shouldn't be too many injustices and there should be some saving, um, rescues in, in the Academic Freedom Committee. So even though it is embarrassing some of the things that faculty do and say, I would hope that the book is actually more reassuring than sort of humbling. Although those can be the same thing, I suppose. Oh, that, that's a great answer. I am just going to uh, decorate it on the fringes. Um, so Jennifer has been uh, writing to me uh, off and on about our first chapter on context ever since context became a dirty word. Uh, because in the context, see what I did there, a uh, congressional hearing invoking context for calls for genocide seems kind of not to be able to read the room. And yet, um, that's exactly what you have to do in, a, in, in every context. So to go back over the reason, uh, it's it's a, a kind of a, a bittersweet moment. No, no, it's not bitter at all. So this is very, uh, we wrote this book, uh, we hashed out a sort of prospectus that became the beginning of an introduction. I said, I'll tell you what, let me take the first chapter and I'll pass the baton on to you after a couple of things. And when Jennifer got the first chapter, she was like, what is this stuff about context? You're spinning your wheels. And I'm like, I'm not spinning our wheels. I'm setting the table for stuff that, you know, uh, again, also, <clears throat> I have to confess, there were a couple of things in there I wanted to, to get to, but also to establish some principles as to how we're going to proceed. And I had that, so if I had that back, I, I think I would have put more emphasis on what Jennifer does. So, um, because if I'm I'm doing the storytelling in the book, uh, she's like 80% of the ideas. And then I come in for comic relief. Uh, and one of the ideas is turning these decisions over to administrators is not only risky in and of itself, but it leads to kind of snap judgment, suspension the next day, you know, caving into political pressure, whether at Hamline University or USC with, uh, with the pronunciation of a Chinese word that sounds like the N-bomb. But turning them over to faculty <laughs> committees ensures that things will go slowly <laughs> and properly slowly. We we're going to go back and look at what in the world the context of that tweet was. But, you know, for, that was actually my phrase, decontextualization apparatus. I, I intend to copyright it um, because it's so hard to know what the context of a tweet is. Right? So, um, but as for professors behaving badly, uh, 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 someone in the uh, American Federation of Teachers had just read our book. Jennifer, I'm just sharing this with you now. And was appalled to that same reason. They thought this is these are cases we've got here. Some of them so clearly beyond the pale that uh, it seems like you know behavior or speech like this itself delegitimates ten. And I was like, yeah, but uh, we're gonna walk back from that and say, look, um, if you give us time and due diligence and due process, we're going to do our best to get this right. And it, that means again trying to determine. Uh, I'll give you one example from my own, I've since canceled my, my formerly known as Twitter account, but I was a, a expert witness in a, in a federal academic freedom case. And one of the things that came up in the deposition was uh, a tweet I had long forgotten that said, um, even Hitler uh, did not um, inflict Sean Spicer on his people. And I, was, I, I, I went deer in headlights. I said, I don't even... I'm going to have to reverse engineer that one. And it was because Sean Spicer had said in a press uh, conference that day that even Hitler had not used poison gas on his people. This hits me pretty close to where I live because the T4 program, not only in the lead up to the gassing of millions of Jews, but the T4 program was launched against people with, with, uh, with disabilities. So that it, 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 historical ignorance that profound that almost amounts to press secretary Holocaust denial struck me as so egregious that I tweeted about it. But it's very hard to establish the context of that kind of utterance four or five years later. <laughs> Excuse me. And we do think, though, that, um, and this is the one place where our training as literary critics actually was a strength. Like, this is what we did in graduate school. We parsed out debates about intention and effect all the time. Uh, and we think that sort of nuance is usually missing from debates about these controversies all the way back to the original coining of the term cancel culture with cancel Colbert, which we went back and read in context and it's much more complicated than this whole thing. 
All right. Well, uh, thank you both so much. Um, it is a really interesting book. I, I definitely think that everybody in higher education should be reading uh, It's Not Free Speech, should be thinking about these issues. Uh, again, thank you so much, both of you, for, for being here and talking with me about the book. Thank you for having us.